so right about the time I became a Christian, I was in my early 20s, and my friend Nick, uh, he and I were really close. Nick was one of those guys that just everywhere he went, he was the energy of the room. He was the center of attraction and attention. He had everything he did. He just did all the way. You know what I mean? He didn't do anything halfway. Li Nick lived hard. He played hard. He, uh, he worked hard. He just was an all out, all in kind of a guy. And uh, he was always uh, the life of the party. But it wasn't just that Nick did everything he did to his fullest. Nick was also a planner. He was strategic. He was thoughtful. Uh, Nick would always plan out his life. He had all these thoughts and ideas, and, and he did. He worked really hard. I mean, he, um, uh, the job he had, he climbed the ladder so quickly, so uh, obviously that he was, uh, he was promoted to a position that was, I mean, he had to be the youngest guy in the history of the company to be promoted to that position. He was making a ton of money. His life was just set before him. Uh, he had a girl he'd been dating for a while, and um, you know he talked about her a lot and what his plans would be uh, for them. Nick and I were basically inseparable. He was a sharp guy. I mean, he uh, Nick was uh, his dad had been a game warden in Florida for many years, and so Nick grew up around guns. He grew up around you know hunting and fishing and things like this. And whenever we were at his house, and you know. T looking at his, you know, the, the guns his dad had, he was always really careful, really cautious. He was super cautious, I mean, just the way his dad had told him and taught him. Nick and I would travel a lot. We'd go camping, we'd go out of town, and he would drive. Uh, he was always really careful. I mean, he had this really just huge brand new Jeep. Like every couple years, he'd get a, a bigger and a newer Jeep, and we were always really cautious with it. He took really good care of that thing. In fact, he had just bought a brand new Jeep. Uh, a little bit later, like a few weeks later, he went and bought a brand new Ducati uh, motorcycle. I mean, it was like his pride and joy, and he was always really cautious with that thing. Um, this one day, he, he and I had spent the entire day together, which is what we did whenever our day off was at the same time. And so we'd spent the whole day together. And he had been telling me all that day about, uh, you know, his girlfriend, he was going to propose to her. He had the ring picked out and she had no idea and he was going to surprise her with this proposal. Uh, he also drove me over to the house that he was working on purchasing where they were going to live. He had even told me and we drove by the church, the two of them were going to attend together and just had all these plans and everything and he'd gotten that new promotion. And anyway, we were together the entire day and it was just a wonderful day, like a celebration day for, for Nick. And um, I had to work the next morning. So late that night, he drops me off at my house. I go into work early the next morning and about first thing that morning, his girlfriend called me and said, Brian, have you spoken to Nick's parents? And I said, no, I was with Nick all day yesterday, but I haven't talked to his parents. And she said, have you not heard? And I said, heard what? She said, Brian, Nick died last night. And I was just stunned. After Nick dropped me off at my house, he was in such a great mood that he, he went home and he Dropped off his Jeep, but he hopped on his motorcycle. The other car never saw him. It was late at night, and Nick went through the intersection on a wheelie, and his headlight was up in the air. So as the other car pulled out in front of him, Nick just cut it in half. He was killed immediately. You can imagine how devastated his family was. In fact, I was the one that was asked to go identify the body. We lived in this little bitty small town. Everyone knew everyone. Everyone knew the police. The police knew everyone. The, uh, the teachers were the same teachers your parents had. And, you know, it was just a, a tight-knit, close-knit community right outside of Charlotte. I mean, the, the neighborhood or the community was so small. Even the roads in the uh, community didn't even have street lights at night because everyone knew the roads so well. Nick knew the roads. He was incredibly familiar with the roads and the directions. He was incredibly familiar with his motorcycle. He knew all the ways that he should have been. Even his sister was the first paramedic to arrive on the scene. He made one 
careless mistake. And one decision can have a disastrous effect. One careless mistake can have an eternal consequence. The Bible tells us about two men in particular who made one mistake and they lost their lives as a result of it. If you've got a Bible, I want you to turn to Leviticus chapter 9. Leviticus chapter 9. If you're a guest, I'm glad you're here. Uh, Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're thinking Leviticus, like what in the world? Here's the thing with Leviticus, man. Leviticus is usually the book that most people hop over and never open, end up having trouble trying to find it. Uh, Leviticus is the the book where, um, you know, it's like, hey, this is a, this is a book about priests and the priesthood. Is there anything that I can get out of this priesthood type book for me as a modern day 2022 person living in America or whatever? Leviticus is so filled with incredible insight of what God is about and what God wants for us. And so if you found your Bible, Leviticus chapter 10 is where we're going to be. I'll be surprised if we get past verse 3 today. So I'm going to read it and pray and we'll continue in the message. Verse 1 of chapter 3 says this. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord which he had not commanded them and fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord then Moses said to Aaron it's what the Lord spoke saying by those who come near me I'll be treated as holy and before all the people I'll be honored so Aaron therefore kept silent let's pray Father, we love you and we're thankful for today, God. We're thankful that you've extended our life to this moment, Lord. Your mercy, your grace has allowed that we would be gathered together. And God, I'm thankful that we are gathered on this day to hear your word. And God, this is a heavy passage. There's a lot of questions about this passage and there's a lot of concern about this passage. And so God, I ask that you would speak to us through your word And give us understanding of what it is you would have us do as a result of it. What does this mean for us, God? Father, I ask that as as we're gathered and there's a large number of us and, and folks watching online, Lord, I ask that you would draw us near to you. God, that's the name of this series, Drawing Near. And we want to know how to draw close. We want to know what it means to be near you. So God, through this passage, would you answer those questions to us and how we should be. Father, for any in here who are dealing with anything, struggling with some kind of fear or frustration, God, any dealing with an addiction or depression or whatever it is, God, I just pray you would show them who you are. Let them sense your love. and Let all of us feel your presence. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a a passage that a lot of people try to figure out how it relates to us and what it means and and how can even a God who we believe to be a good and benevolent and loving God, how could God allow something like this to happen? And so first, let's just go to the text and see maybe there's a clue inside the text as to why God would strike them dead immediately and give this capital offense, capital punishment to their, to their offense that he would just take their life instantly. So we look at verse one, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans. Okay, what's a fire pan? A fire pan is what the priests would use. It's just like a big frying pan with a long pole and they would go to the altar. They would have these particular coals from a particular altar and they would take it to a different altar if that was necessary. Uh, There's nothing wrong with what they did here. The fire pans were the right ones. It says, after putting fire in them, in fact, the word for fire there is actually the word for coals, the hot hot burning coals, uh, placed incense on it. 
and offered strange fire before the Lord. I don't know, maybe, and there, there's, I, I found 12 different suggestions of what could have been the particular sin Nadab and Abihu uh, committed that resulted in their capital punishment, taking their life in that moment. Uh, some say, well, maybe they offered the coals uh, at the wrong time. Some say maybe they used the wrong coal. Some say maybe they used the wrong incense. They you know, they used the wrong recipe or didn't follow the ingredients the right way, the way it was laid out for them. Some say they uh, maybe went too, too deep into the tabernacle. They went behind the curtain. They weren't, I mean, all these different ideas. The simple fact is we're not told specifically what the problem was. And what we are told is they disobeyed God. They hadn't done what God had said. It says that, uh, which he had not commanded. They offered strange fire. Even the word strange gives us no clue. Strange just means different or other. Sometimes it's used uh, for foreigners that were among them. These are people that are different than us. They're strange. It just, in fact, in some Bible translations, it'll say unauthorized fire. It's a fine translation. It just means they did something they were not commanded to do. They did not follow what God had commanded them to do. And then God God responded in such a way he took their life immediately. You say, well, maybe it's who they were. God didn't know them very well. Well, you have a problem with that idea too, man. I mean, we see in other passages, God called them by name. Way back in uh, Exodus 24, uh, God had said through Moses, I want you to come, he said to Moses, I want you to come near to me and I want you to get Aaron and his sons Nadab and Abihu and come near to me and worship. I mean, God called them by name and it's written in the scripture forever, you know. A few chapters later in, in Exodus 28, God even calls them by name to be ministers to him, priests to him. He says, hey, get Aaron and his sons Nadab and Abihu, they are to be ministers to me. I mean, there seems to be this, closeness, this relationship that God even had with them as priests. I mean, so it wasn't that he didn't know them. It wasn't that he wasn't familiar with them. It wasn't that they didn't know God. I mean, even the fact that uh, their dad is Aaron. I mean, you might think that they would go, okay, uh, these are the sons of Aaron. Let's cut them some slack because of who their dad is. I mean, that, that doesn't happen. And so we're stuck as the reader going, this, this just seems harsh. And this seems heavy, you know? And it'd be a lot more fun if we just read the passages that were about blessings and gifts and, and all the ways in which God loves and doesn't get upset and all that kind of stuff. But the problem is there's a lot of passages like this. I mean, it's, this isn't even like a, a unique passage of a very difficult saying. I mean, I read the Bible and I find passage after passage throughout it from Genesis to Revelation where there's something hard to accept that you come across. I mean, there's a passage in uh, Numbers 21, uh, the people of Israel, God had been leading them out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of bondage. They get to a place where they don't like what's going on with their circumstances. They start complaining and like whining about the food and about whatever. God gets so annoyed with their complaining. It says that God sent poisonous snakes among them to kill them. And snakes are biting people just for their griping and complaining. Now, some of you are like, I totally get that. But some of you are probably thinking, this is a little harsh. Like, did that really happen? There's another passage um, in 1 Samuel 15 where uh, God had said to Saul, the king at the time, uh, I want you to go conquer this people, kill this people. I don't want any um, remainder of sin to intermingle with my people of, of Israel and kill them, even the king. But here's the thing, uh, Saul, the king of Israel, decided to show a little mercy, a little compassion on their king, Agag, and let him live. Like, all right, you can live, just you know, play it cool. Well, then the prophet Samuel shows up, and you might be reading this thinking, okay, he's a prophet. Prophets, you know, they're ones who talk to God, and they share the word of God, and maybe, they'll, maybe this particular prophet will be kind, and that's not at all what happens. I mean, it says in that passage that Samuel walks up and is like, is that Agag? You were supposed to kill him. And so Agag comes up and he's like, Samuel, man, it's good to see you. And you're thinking maybe it's going to be okay. It's not okay. Samuel takes a sword and chops him into pieces, kills him. And you're reading that like, okay, what just happened? Right? This is, did this really happen? And this isn't even some of the other, this isn't like even the worst of the hard passages. There's another passage where, uh, Moses had gone up on a mountain. This is in Exodus 32. And when he's gone, the people get tired of waiting. So they decide to worship a different God. Moses comes down and they're worshiping a calf. Remember that? A little golden calf. 
Moses is offended. God's angered. And so God says to Moses, here's what I want you to do. And then this, is, it, this next verse, 27, records what Moses said to them. It says, he said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, every man of you put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi, the priests, the priests did this, the sons of Levi, I did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. And you're like, did this really happen? I mean, this is intense, right? So what do we do with passages like this? I mean, for a lot of people, it's like either you never hear of passages like this, you choose to avoid passages like this, and then what happens is your theology becomes so undeveloped and falsely developed that the God you say that you believe in is not the God of the Bible at all. With Nadab and Abihu, I mean, what was so wrong? What was so sinful that their death was warranted? They they took their fire pans, they put fire in them, they placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord. Imagine you're one of the Israelites that day. You're there in the camp. And just in the previous chapter, like not long before this moment happened, God had sent down fire from heaven as a, a, a response of, of pleasure because they had set up all these sacrifices. Like in the previous chapter, chapter nine, and those of you who've been going through this with us, so far every chapter is like, God said to do something, the people did it, God was pleased. Next chapter, God says do something, they, they were obedient, God was pleased. Next chapter, next. And then you get to chapter nine, and it's the first time ever that the people of Israel worship together corporately in this big gathered like church service, kind of like, like us today. First time you've got the priesthood, first time you have all the sacrifices laid out where God has orchestrated how he wanted to be worshiped and all the ways and all the expectations and policies and procedures. He ordains the priesthood. In the previous chapter, Aaron becomes the main priest. He sort of takes over the priesthood role from Moses. So Moses becomes prophet. Aaron's the priest. I mean, all this just happened. And then the fire of God comes down and his pleasure takes the sacrifice. So if you're there as an Israelite, you see that you're like, ah, oh, this is so cool, man. Fire came down from God out of heaven and shows his pleasure with us and takes the sacrifice. It's so good being in God's will. There's this big joyful celebration when that happened. And then it seems like only moments later, Nadab and Abihu come out. So imagine moments later, you see another pillar of fire come down and you go, oh, that's so awesome. God is still pleased with us. Only you find out later that wasn't the fire of God's pleasure. That was the fire of God's judgment. And the two oldest sons of Aaron were just killed because of their disobedience. I mean, imagine if you're the, the mom or the dad of Nadab and Abihu. I mean, it's their first day on the job. And they got their brand new priest outfit on that, I don't know, maybe their mom stitched it together and it's just shiny white, not a stain on it. They got their fancy decorations and everyone's there like, oh, these are our boys, so proud of them. So excited, this is gonna be great. He had no idea God was gonna take them in that moment. I mean, what were they even thinking, Nadab and Abihu? Because it's not like they weren't aware of what God had said. In previous chapters and in previous passages, they were told what fire pan, what coal, uh, what fire. They were told the exact recipe of the incense, when to offer it, how to offer it, where they were supposed to go. I mean, God could not have been more clear about all the instructions. And in this moment, they became too familiar with God, too familiar with his word, and they were just careless and one careless mistake can have a disastrous consequence. I wonder what they were thinking. Maybe they were like, yeah, I know what God's word says, but come on, man, our dad's Aaron. I mean, he and God are tight, right? I mean, is God really gonna care if we don't follow his word just right? I mean, come on, man, he knows us. Besides, he even called us by name. Our names are in Exodus 24. He called us into this job by name. Our names are in Exodus 28. Which of you have your name in the Bible? It's okay, our dad's Aaron. We're in the Bible, we can get away with this. 
Maybe they were thinking, eh, God really won't mind. It's not that big a deal. Yeah, yeah, here's the recipe for incense. I mean, come on, incense is incense. Who really cares? You know, it's it's not a big deal. Maybe they're thinking, you know, I've been following God for a long time. I mean, dude, our uncle is Moses. Our dad is Aaron. We grew up in this stuff. We know exactly how to behave. We know what we're supposed to do. We know who God is. We were there at Sinai. We were there with the pillars of fire and cloud. We know all about God. We grew up with God. We're, it's fine if we do this. He'll understand. Or maybe they're even saying, God knows we mean well. Maybe we didn't really follow what he said, but look, our heart's in the right place. We're on God's side. Maybe that's just ancient thinking. You know, I mean, what what is it that we try to convince ourselves of in a modern age, like in 2022? Eh, I mean, God is love. That's what it says in the New Testament. God's love, right? I mean, if what we're doing comes from a place of love, then, then God won't mind I mean, if, if I'm an adult and they're an adult and we're both adults and we decide how we're going to love each other and we decide who we get to love, this all comes from a place of love. So it doesn't matter what we do or how we love as long as it's love because God is love. Or maybe we try to remind God of his responsibility. I mean, maybe you're in here A lot, and you hear me teach about where God is a forgiving God. And in 1 John, it says that if we ask for forgiveness, God will forgive us. And so maybe we tell ourselves things like, look, yeah, what I'm doing might technically not be good. Maybe technically it's sinful, but God will forgive. I'll just say I'm sorry at some point. God will forgive. In fact, God has to forgive me. I've heard you preach it, Brian. He has to forgive me. That's his job. I mean, I wonder if they had just gotten so comfortable with God that they were just over familiar with God. Maybe they had become so familiar with God that it was just careless. I mean, God forgives, God's love. Does it really matter what he commands? I mean, sometimes I I wonder if we don't start saying things to ourselves like, Yeah, yeah, I know what God commands, but I got a really good idea. I know what God's word says, but I feel like this is better. I know what God is wanting and it says in his word, but this is a really good idea in the moment. And can I just tell you, God's great commands are always better than your great ideas. You might say, well, but I know God really well. I know his word really well. I mean, I grew up with this. Okay, good. Knowing God does not remove his authority over you. You might go, yeah, but I go beyond knowing him. I also serve God. I serve him a lot. Good. Serving God does not remove his authority over you. Are you hearing me? I mean, this series is answering how do we draw near to God. I mean, that's the goal that we should have. That's the goal that God has for us. You understand, you cannot draw near to God through disobedience. God is not passive. God does not waver. God will never negotiate on holiness. Maybe you read this and you go, okay, well, how could God God do something like this? I mean, Aaron, their father, seems to be wondering the same thing. Just imagine now you're Aaron and you just witnessed God taking your kids. So verse three, Moses said to Aaron, it's what the Lord spoke, saying by those who come near me, I'll be treated as holy and before all the people I'll be honored. Can we just stop right there for a moment? How about that from a response for your, from your pastor? I mean, you're standing there. Maybe Aaron had a lot of joy and, and godly pride in what was happening in that moment with his kids. They've grown up. God's using them. They're serving. And then immediately you watch as he sends fire from heaven and, and takes them. I mean, imagine what was going on in his heart as the blood left his face and feels like it just filled his stomach and his knees go weak. Maybe you would expect something pastoral from Pastor Moses to come over and say, Aaron, man, I am so sorry. I don't know what to say. God is having a really bad day. He's been under a lot of stress, okay? He's just acting out. 
Like, what is, what is it that we would expect the pastor to say in this point? I mean, sometimes being pastor means cutting straight to the point. Sometimes being the pastor means simply stating with clarity what God has said. Pastoring is not always tender. Pastoring sometimes is pretty stern. Have you noticed how often people want to redefine what they believe a pastor ought to do or say? People tend to redefine the office of pastor as he is always tender, he's always passive. A pastor is to always be soft. But that's not always what the Bible tells us a pastor is to be. I mean, we have passages throughout the Bible where the prophet of God is the most blunt one in the room. It's the reason all the prophets were killed. We have passages where all the apostles were direct and which of the apostles weren't killed. There's over a handful of direct passages in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus where we learn about the office of the pastor and one of the requirements, the commands of a pastor is to reprove, which means to rebuke. It means to confront with bluntness those who are in sin. God never compromises on his holiness. People do. People compromise. God never does. And with Nadab and Abihu, the judgment was swift. I mean, capital punishment immediately. And you go, why would God be so swift with his judgment? Because God understands everyone's watching. And if Nadab and Abihu got away with it, you know what happens? People will do what others get away with. You say, yeah, but capital punishment. Man, it's always been that way with God. Remember even in the garden, God said, you see that tree? Don't, don't eat it. That's my one rule for you. It's my one law. Don't eat from that tree because the day in which you eat of it, you'll surely die. Capital punishment. You know what we do? What we as humans tend to do about who's most right who's best, who we should emulate. Listen to me, this is like universal. What humans do in any country is they say, we say, whoever has uh, the most popularity, that's who I wanna be, be like. Whoever has the most amount of money, they must be right. How could they be wrong? They've got all this money. How could they be wrong? They have all this popularity. They have by far the most followers. They have by far the most wealth. I mean, look at their cars and their homes and their vacations. Follow their Instagram. How could they be po I want to be like them. Because our measurement of truth is popularity, fame, wealth. It's not God's measurement. God's measure is holiness. The lie that we've been told is that God's greatest desire is for your happiness. It's a lie. God's greatest desire is for your holiness. In fact, God desires for you to be holy so strongly that you would even be willing to lose happiness in favor of holiness. But the Devil's done a good job, hasn't he? I mean, he's convinced people that either there is no God or that God's just not serious. The devil has done a great work to take our eyes off of what God has said in his word and instead replaced it with what we should feel about God's behavior. We've embraced the false belief that God is passive, that we can really get away with anything, any behavior, any thought, any belief, as long as you strongly believe it in your heart. It's not what scripture teaches us, but it's what we try to convince ourselves. And we see something that might be outside of God's word and we say, yeah, okay, it's sinful, it's outside of scripture, it's against what God has taught, but hey, listen, let adults do what adults want to do. Hey, listen, let people do what they want to do. I, I don't really care. And if someone wants to, then it doesn't bother me. I wouldn't be angry with that person, so therefore God won't either. I wouldn't punish that person, so therefore God won't either. I wouldn't bring any consequence, so therefore God wouldn't either. These are the people that have, have made God in their own image. These are the people that 
Instead of saying they want to be more like Jesus, they're saying, I want God to be more like me. These are not the thoughts of a follower of God. These are the thoughts of a follower of self. That's where you're trying to say, look, I think God is a lot more similar uh, to me in the way that I think. And so, you know, Psalm 50 talks about this. In Psalm 50, God is talking to people and he says, uh, you hate discipline, you're, you're pleased with thieves, you associate with adulterers, you slander your friends. And then he says in this 20, verse 21, you thought that I was just like you. That's what God says to us. You thought I was like you. We've become addicted. We've become drug addicts. But our drug of addiction is God's grace. We've gone from desiring God's grace to demanding it. Maybe we think it's something that God just did one time. And this one time, God took Nadab and Abihu to make a point once and for all. And God has softened up, you know. The problem is this isn't something God just did one time. There was a time uh, when the Ark of God, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was being transported from one place to the next and God had given all this teaching and all these commands about how the Ark was to be handled because inside the Ark was the representation or the presence of God. And so he said, look, there's to be this certain box made uh, and the box is to have these certain like eyelets that have like these holes in it on, on each side, like multiple eyelets. And then when it's time to, to move the ark, you should get these certain poles and the poles are to be inserted through those eyelets, one on each side. And then certain priests are to lift up that ark and they're to carry it a certain way. The problem was the people were like, I got a way better idea. We could do this a whole lot quicker if we take the ark, put it on this cart and let an ox tow the cart and it'll be quicker, easier, faster, heavier. The people won't get tired. It can be tiresome, you know, sometimes obeying God. And so the Ark of the Covenant's on this ox cart and it's going from one place to the next. And apparently there's like a pothole in the path and the Ark begins to like almost fall over because the cart's about to fall over. This one priest named Uzzah is trying to save God, rescue God. And so he reaches out his hand to stable the Ark real fast. And then God strikes Uzzah dead right then. And you're like, okay, well, it just, what just happened? See, Uzzah thought it was better for him to figure out a better way than to obey God. It was, it was better for him to figure out a smarter way than for him to obey God. Uzzah was so confused that he thought the sin of his flesh hand was somehow cleaner than the mud that God had created that the ark might fall in. That would be dirty, but his sinful hand was, was clean in Uzzah's mind. God says, I'm asking for holiness and obedience. And you go, okay, well, fine, Brian, that's Old Testament stuff, man. That's why I like the God of the New Testament. Well, then you've got to explain to me what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Because that was post-resurrection in a church service. During the time of the offering, Ananias and Sapphira come in lying to God, putting in their small percentage, nowhere near the tithe, but lying, letting people think this is the tithe. Peter calls him out and he's like, you're lying to God, you're lying to us. The money was yours, but you're trying to make us think that you're being so sacrificial and tithing, you're not. Boom, they drop dead. They even get their bodies carried out and the worship continued. Before you go, goodness, God is cruel. Before you think God's cruel for taking the lives of Nadab and Abihu and Uzzah and Ananias and Sapphira and Agag. I want you to understand, he's not cruel. It's not at all the case. God could just as easily take your life right now. And it's not because of his power, right, that I say that. It's because he would be justified by taking your life right now. I mean, don't forget what God said in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. God is just if he takes a life. 
He gave us life. He created us. He gives us every organ we've got, including our heart and our lungs. He created the oxygen that we breathe. He has done all of this, and all he's asked for us is holiness and to honor him as holy. That's what Moses was trying to say. Look, it's what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I'll be treated as holy, and before all the people, I'll be honored. And then it says at the end of verse three, so Aaron therefore kept silent. The Hebrew says Aaron shut his mouth. It's like, well, what else could Aaron do? Was he gonna argue his ways before God? God, have you forgotten? I'm their dad. Yoo-hoo. Come on, man, I'm, I'm being faithful in my service to you. I've repented of my sins and I came to you and this is how you repay me. God, what are you thinking? How about a little leniency? I mean, these are two adults and they're trying to serve. They just did it their own way. They're trying to follow. They're just doing it their own way. They're trying to be believers. They're just doing it their own way. I mean, is Aaron really going to argue this against God as if God doesn't know? And so he kept silent. And God would have just said, you, you think I'm like you. So what does all of it mean that he took these lives because of, of, of sin, because of disobedience? It means that all these people who were killed were treated fairly. And the only reason that you and I are alive right now is because of God's great mercy and his patience. I mean, the fire of God shows up multiple times throughout the Bible. It's never neutral. Sometimes when the fire of God comes down, it's out of pleasure. Sometimes when the fire of God comes down, it's out of judgment. But the fire of God never flows without a purpose, and the purpose is in response to your actions. We say, well, I sure do love God's grace. So do I. But you understand that even grace comes along with justice. I mean, even the grace of salvation, that's what Ephesians tells us, right? Salvation is by grace. But you understand it, it included punishment, it's just that Jesus took it for us. I mean, we receive the grace of God, we receive the grace of salvation because Jesus took the wrath of God, it burned against him on the cross. And the wages of sin that are death, all of the wrath of God against all of the sin of humanity poured out on God, I mean, as if fire from heaven fell on him. And all the blood of Jesus that we sang about a moment ago applied to those who by faith believe and place their faith in God through Christ. And by that faith, by that grace, you're made clean. I mean, we just sang it. You're washed clean by the blood. All the forgiveness takes place. I mean, it makes us realize how significant it is what Jesus did for us. He took the wrath of God so that we wouldn't have to, but it's not automatic. I mean, the words of that song are great. It doesn't say that you automatically gave me. It says that applied. How do you have the blood of Jesus applied to you? Grace through faith. Not grace through knowledge, not grace through service, grace through faith. And you have to ask, have I placed my faith in Christ? That's why God sent him. Otherwise, every one of us is only awaiting the moment for the wrath of God to burn against us for our sin. Just one decision can have an eternal effect. One decision. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what happens the more you start to draw near to God? The closer you get to him, the more you see his holiness. And the closer you get to him, the more you begin to reflect his holiness. And God's holy and he'll be treated as holy by those who draw near. So if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, you understand that one decision will have an eternal result. It's a free gift. I'm gonna ask you to pray with me.
And as you bow your head and close your eyes, it could be that your being here right now was the first time you've had this truly understood. It could be that you being here now was God's way of giving you one last chance. It could be that you're hearing this passage as God's wake-up call to you. And it could be that right now God is drawing you to him. So your head is bowed, your eyes are closed, and I think everyone in here just needs a moment to think through and respond to what we're hearing in this passage. And for someone, this could be your last opportunity to make that one eternal decision. And so, though our head our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, in a moment I'll say amen and the altar will be open. And if it's The altar will be open and you can respond. You can come forward. There'll be people down here. And you can just say, I'm ready to place my faith in Christ. I don't, I don't want to face the wrath of God. I want to be a child of God. And if that's you, just slip out of the pew, come forward. There'll be folks down here who'd love to talk to you. It could be that it's time, and you know it's time to maybe join the church or set up baptism. Whatever the decision is. But don't convince yourself you have more time you you don't know when that last time will be and as God is giving you one more chance to make that one decision you should take it Father we're thankful we're thankful for the patience you show to us we're thankful that you've given us this moment God we're thankful that you've extended our life to now that we have another chance to respond to you and God let us not presume that we can make this decision tomorrow or next week or next year. God, we don't know what tomorrow will bring. So God, I'm asking that you would give strength and courage where it's needed. There's probably someone here right now that knows they need to respond, but they're afraid. They're afraid, they're scared of how it might look, what others might say. So God, I'm asking that you would give that person strength to respond. church as your eyes are closed right now in a moment I'll say amen and then we'll stand and we'll sing this is your time of response take it take this time and and come closer to God father help us as we respond in Jesus we pray amen